السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ توحید و سنت ڈاٹ کام الحمد للہ اللہ حدا والصلاۃ والسلام علی عباده الذین اصطفا خصوصا علی سید الرسول و خاتم الانبیاء و علی آلہ و اصحابہ الذین اجتبا اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم
So Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam recited the whole Quran to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recited the whole Quran back to Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam. After finishing it once, now again Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam recited the whole Quran to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then again Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recited it back to Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam. When Sahaba Rizwanullah realized that it was done twice this year, so they knew that there is something very special about it. And therefore, all of these Sahaba Rizwanullah started taking all of their writings, whatever they had in writing, the ayahs of the Quran and the surahs of the Quran, they started taking it back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Ya Rasulullah, I would like to read this ayah back to you from my writing to make sure that it's in the same exact form as you and Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam have revised it. Which means the ayah was not abrogated. He did not make any mistake in writing the ayah and memorizing the ayah. So they would confirm it from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Whatever they had in writing, not necessarily that every Sahabi will be confirming the whole Qur'an. Some of them, for example, have Surah Yasin written with them. So they will recite, they will, they will go back and recite Surah Yasin to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Especially, and it was very important for those Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa jma'in, who used to write the revelation for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because they used to save it for themselves. They used to keep it with themselves. Everything was not saved at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's home. It was saved at their own home. So they started taking all of these writings back that they wrote from the revelation. Taking it back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, confirming it, Ya Rasulullah, because this is part of the final revelation, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would confirm it for those Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhi wa sallam. But later on, there were some Orientalists who felt that this Quran is not in proper order. We have to do some research about Quran to bring it back in the order that it was revealed in. Muslims have changed the order of the Quran and we the Christians and the Jews have to put the Quran in proper order. And they started doing their research on Quran. And on the name of research, they started changing the order of the Quran. In the beginning, they would only change the order of the surahs. And gradually, they started getting into changing the order of the ayahs also. They would say, no, this ayah doesn't belong to Surah Al-Baqarah. These Muslims made mistakes. Sahaba Rizwan al they didn't know too much about it, they made a mistake. So they would try to put this ayah from Surah Al-Baqarah, put it somewhere else. Take an ayah from Surah Al-Imran, put it in Surah Al-Baqarah. There was a person, Arthur Jeffrey. He started doing this type of effort. And he wrote some articles about the subject saying that this Qur'an is not authentic at this point because the order is not correct. It's, it's true that Muslims have memorized it, they have preserved it, but since they don't know the right order of it, therefore they cannot drive the right understanding out of it. So therefore, he started doing his research about changing the order of Qur'an al-Karim. And of course, he came up with a new Qur'an. <coughs> Arthur Jeffrey came up with a new Qur'an in which he had changed all the orders of the surahs of Qur'an al-Karim. In other words, they would take the hadith from Bukhari and say, okay, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq has to be the first surah, not surah Fatih. So they would put surah al-Alaq in the beginning of Quran. And accordingly, then surah al-Mudassir and then surah al-Muzammil, and they would change the order of the whole Quran. 
There was another person, J. M. Rodwell. He wrote a whole Quran, new Quran for himself, you can say. Before writing, bringing up that Quran, he wrote a book. And that book was really used a lot in, as a reference book in many of the, uh, in many of the universities where they have Islamic faculties and uh, Islamic subjects and where they seem to teach or at least they claim that they teach Islam. The name of the book is also very amazing. He says the name of the book is New Research into the Composition of Quran. On the name of this research, this man was the first person who changed the whole order of each and every eye of Quran. Of course, these people were doing it, and they still continue doing the same thing. But unfortunately, many Muslims were attracted by the idea. And we find that there were our own people who started following the same idea that let's try to find out the right order of Quran. And when we say the right order of Quran, that simply means the one that me and you have doesn't have the right order, it's the wrong order. What's the reason behind it? These people have a special goal behind changing the order of the Quran. Nowadays, this is a very well known way and effect that if you would like to hurt someone, change the facts of a life <laughs> and change the facts that have been accepted by the whole world up to this day, up to this day and come up with something new you don't have to curse at those people and tell them that you are wrong you don't have to tear, take their books and burn them down you don't have to tell those people that whatever you are following is false all you do is tell them that I'm doing the research on the name of research, today you can do anything in the world. On the name of research, they will do research on the prophets of Allah, and then come up with a conclusion that God forbid and that prophet, yeah, although he was right, and although he was very intelligent, and he was this and this and that, but these were the things that if he would have done them, the other way would have been better. This is a research. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a good person. <coughs> but the message would have been much more effective if someone else would have got the message. This is research. And this person who's doing the research, what can you tell him? Because he feels that when I study the history, this is what I feel. And you can do nothing about people's feelings. And the way they would present this will be that Islam is a good way. Islam is a real good way of life. But Muslims are not good. Quran is preserved, but the order is not correct. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a very intelligent person. But there were some steps he took in his life that were not correct. This is research. So in the name of research, <laughs> there was start changing the facts. You can change the religions. You can change Quran. You can change the Ahadith. And amazingly, they will go back to our Ahadith to change these facts about Qur'an al kareem as I just mentioned. And we have to admit, in order to impress us with their work, they did a lot of 
the study on the Quran. And they did a lot of study of the hadith also. The first best index of a hadith that was written, it was written by some non-Muslims in seven volumes. That it still stands as one of the very good index of a hadith. That if you would like to find a hadith in any of the six authentic books of a hadith, of course, nowadays in the computer age, we will have much better software and ways of finding the hadith in those books. But as far as the books are concerned, there are many more indexes of a hadith, but this was one of the best that was written at the time. A group of seven or eight of them from France who wrote that index of a hadith. Of course, the purpose was for them that whenever they are doing any research about Quran, they would like to find out the faults in the Quran and Hadith, it's difficult for them to find a Hadith. So let's write an index of Hadith. And a person who doesn't even know the alphabets of the subject, when he would start writing an index for himself that I don't know nothing and then for therefore I have to make such, uh, make such an index that easily I can find any Hadith in any of these books. So he'll try to make it as easy and as simple and as comprehensive as he can. When a person who's master in the subject, when he would write it, he would think that these things are not needed. There are certain things that are well known, so I don't have to write <laughs> nothing about it, waste my time for this. And that was the reason they made it so comprehensive that they would choose each and every word from these books of a hadith and they would try to find all the other words that are related to this word in their hadith and put all of them together. So they did some work about the hadith and indexes of a hadith. But of course, for the same purpose, finding faults in the Quran and the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So I was mentioning that these people came up with the new Quran, with the totally new type of Qur'an that, in which they had changed all the orders of the ayat and they started guessing. We have to remember this point that no one can find the ahadith about all the ayahs of the Qur'an. There are some ayahs of ahkam that we can find the orders of those ayahs from the ahadith that this ayah was revealed before the other ayah. But most of the ayahs of the Qur'an Nowadays, we cannot even find out when, where, and what state they were revealed. Someone wants to find out when was the story of Nuh alayhi salatu was salam revealed in Surah al -Nur. We can never find it out. The hadith never talk about those subjects. We will only find out about ahkam that this order was in the beginning of Islam and later on it was aggregated and the other order came later on. So accordingly we can guess, okay, this ayah has to be before the other ayah. General rule might be, if a person takes an ayah in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about jihad, so we can very well tell that this ayah was revealed after the hijrah because before hijrah there was no jihad. These type of rules will tell us approximate idea when the ayah was revealed. But to get exact order of revelation of all the ayahs of the Quran and change them from the order they are in now, there is was no way we can find a hadith about them. It will be only guesses and this is exactly what the research means that they are doing nowadays. This is what the research is about. So I was mentioning this Quran that we have. This is the order and the order we have it in is the same order that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam confirmed it with Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam in the last years of his life. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recited this Quran in the same order to Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam. Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam recited it to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this order of Qur'an that we have it 
there is no reason that anyone would even want to know any other order of the Quran and the order of the revelation because Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhi wa jama'in, although they were at the time, at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it was very easy for them to ask Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, when was that surah was revealed? When was the other ayah was revealed? Ya Rasulullah, can you tell me the detail of each and every ayah when they were revealed, in which order they were revealed? But they were never, never asked this question. You won't find a single hadith that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was requested by Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhi wa sallam or without a request, thinking this is a very important subject of Islam. Let's discuss and train khutbah to all the Sahaba about the proper order of the Quran that it was revealed in. No. He only told them the order in which he was asked to put the Quran in by Jibreel alayhi wa sallam. And they all memorized it in the same order as we have it nowadays. So we don't have any need to do any research on this Qur'an and try to make any changes in the order of Qur'an al This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now wants it for us. And this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written this Qur'an in Lawh al-Mahfuz. This is the real order. This Qur'an is in Lawh al-Mahfuz on the seventh hill. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, إِنَّهُ لَقُرْآنٌ كَرِيمٌ فِي كِتَابٍ مَكْنُونٌ it's preserved in a book by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the seventh book. لا يمسه إلا المطهرون Only angels can touch that Qur'an. Human beings have no right to touch that. And that Qur'an is in the same order as, it's, as, as, as the Qur'an that we have. Only the revelation was little different because ayahs were revealing according to the need of the time. And ayahs were revealing according to the situation that Sahaba Rizwan Allah might be facing at that time. And the circumstances of that time. But the Quran is in the same form as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preserved it in, in Allah subhanahu So this is how Sahaba Rizwan Allah compiled Quran al kareem Of course, as I mentioned, that during the time of Sayyidina, Jibir, uh, Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, they wrote the ayah, the surahs of the Quran al kareem each surah compiled in one booklet. Then during the time of Osman radiallahu anhu, they put all the ayahs of the Quran and all the surahs together and they compiled it in the form of one book, the way we have it now. So during the time of Osman radiallahu anhu, it was compiled in the form of one book. At the time of Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, we may say there were 114 booklets. Because of 114 surahs of the Quran. At the time, during the time of Osman radiallahu anhu, all the Sahaba radiallahu anhu, they had a meeting and unanimously agreed that the way we have compiled the Quran now and the writing that we have used, the text that we have used from now and le, uh, in this ummah, from now on, no one is allowed to change even the form of the writing in the Quran al-Kareem. It has to be preserved in the same way as it is written by those Sahaba Rizwanullah Alaihim And I gave you a simple example in our one of the previous sessions that if you take Bismillah rahman rahim normally Bismi has to be ba and Alif then seen and mean, B Ismi. But in our Quran, we find it Bismi without the alif ba seen mean. And we have to keep on writing it the same way as it was written by those Sahaba Ridwan Allah And this is the reason. A very important point that we have to remember that this is the reason that all the scholars of the Ummah have agreed, and there is no difference of opinion about it, that it's not allowed to write the Quran in any other language, which means. We are allowed to translate the Qur'an, write the meanings of Qur'an, but we are not allowed to write the Qur'an into the Arabic language, as we may call it transliteration, that reading it, instead of writing Basim, mean we write B-I-S-M, Bismi. This is not allowed. It is not allowed to write the Qur'an in that form. And a very simple way to understand this will be, if you write it in that form, and then ask someone who doesn't know the Qur'an 
to read it to you from that from that text. Read it to you in English. You'll find that it's nothing even close to what you think the Quran is about. And changing the Quran like that is not allowed. This is how the people change their books in the previous ummah, the previous nations. This is how their books were changed. Because there are so many letters in the Arabic language that have no pronunciation in any other language. You cannot pronounce off in the English. You have to use either Q or K for it. Which is nothing close to Qa. There is no Qa in it. In Arabic language we have three letters which are very similar. Wa, Zal, and Za. What letters do we have to replace these three letters? It will be the same letter that we will have to keep on repeating for all three of them. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us in the Quran, in the Hadith, that this Quran has to be pronounced and recited exactly the same way as it was recited by Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam when he recited it to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recited the same thing in the same way to Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also assigned some Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa that if anyone would like to learn Quran should learn it from these Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa because they recited exactly the way I recited. So Qur'an has to be learned from those who have learned it from teaching. Just reading it from the books most of the time will make mistakes. Even reading it just in the Arabic. And imagine if you would read it, it's in Roman text and then we try to read the transliteration. It will be totally something different than what the Qur'an that we have. So it's fun. Rasulullah sallallahu uh, uh, scholars have said that مَن لَمْ يُجَوِّذِ الْقُرْآنَ فَهُوَ آخِرٌ Whoever does not recite the Qur'an in the way it was revealed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that person is getting sin for not correcting his decision. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide all of us. Thank you.